All right, so we're going to begin a new unit entitled A Life of Commitment. And uh, this unit will take us through all of November. I think the uh, last Sunday in November will be the 29th. And so um, the first lesson is Christ's commitment to us. And then the next lesson is going to be our commitment to Christ, our commitment to his word, our commitment to his church, our commitment to pray, our commitment to worship, and our commitment to mission. So there's about seven, seven lessons. And so this one starts with Christ's commitment uh, to us. And so this first lesson then teaches us or reminds us that Jesus Christ uh, was certainly committed to us. You know, his commitment to us was the fact that he loved us to the point of dying a cruel death so that we might have life. And so uh, this word commitment now brings on a lot of talk, doesn't it? You know, today's culture is, uh, is very averse uh, to that word. You know, just look at marriage. You know, I think one of the statistics I've read indicated that currently about 25% of couples live together because they don't want to commit. I uh, heard one guy talk about um, uh, living with his girlfriend in a sort of same way as trying on a pair of shoes. In that, you know, you, you buy a pair of shoes, you try them on, uh, and you know, see if they're they won't fit or if they're comfortable, and you know, if they do, then you keep them, and if they don't, well, then you don't buy. Them. <laughs> so then I got to thinking, boy, is that uh, how we compare a human being now to a pair of shoes or a commitment to marriage? Well, I tell you, uh, that's getting a little bit um, ridiculous. But anyway, 25% of couples live together because they don't want to make a commitment, and. Um, but that, doesn't that word commitment, though, uh, bring on a, another level when we know that the other party is totally committed? So that does change things, right? And so if we know that, it's, isn't it wonderful to know that God is totally committed? And he is totally committed through a personal relationship um, uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's look at uh, the scripture is Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 12, and then 18 to 21. So let's look at um, Romans 5, 6 through 12 to begin with. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through, through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. All right, so the book of Romans is probably Paul's greatest work. Uh, there are some great uh, theological doctrines in, in Romans. Um, the, the plan of salvation is clearly uh, set out there. And the entire book explores the significance of Christ's sacrificial death. Uh, so this book was written to the Roman believers about uh, A.D. 57. Uh, Nero was emperor of Rome at the time, and of course he was one of the, the great persecutors of the church at that time. So all of chapter 5 is really about the security of the believer. And so that points then to God's commitment to us. The entire chapter tells us of Christ's commitment to us. And so I want, first of all, to talk about that commitment or that security, actually. Uh, once a person is saved, uh, it has been my experience, uh, personally and with talking to people, that Satan will immediately cause the new Christian to doubt their salvation. And uh, if Satan has lost his war to get that person into hell, then his next best strategy is to keep the new Christian defeated with doubt. And um, um, so that he or she then won't be effective witness for Jesus Christ. And so doubt then basically is saying that we question the commitment that Jesus Christ then has made to us. So we Christians, um, 
accept the teaching of the New Testament that a person can be eternally saved and we can know it. And so uh, one of the Baptist things that uh, is said and criticized is once saved, always saved. And so that is a biblical doctrine, but it's certainly hotly debated among some denominations. Uh, Baptists believe that a man can be saved, know it, and depend on it. Now, other denominations accuse Baptists of, of getting saved and then living like they want to. Uh, well, uh, that's not biblical salvation. Uh, a person like that may not have ever experienced justification to start with. So, but once uh, salvation has been established or once security has been established by facts and faith, uh, that is, believing the gospel message and then assurance coming uh, is, is maintained in our hearts by trusting God's word. And so the commitment that God makes to us is that once we are saved and he's committed to us and then trusting the commitment that God has made to us um, keeps us uh, from doubting and we are assured then of that commitment that he's made to us. So a man can be saved or a person can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ um, but, but then can sin his way out of God's grace, then the Christian must live in a constant uncertainty about his spiritual destiny. And so, um, you know, what kind of salvation is that? And so with that logic, uh, that which we received on the basis of God's finished work then has to be maintained on the basis of our own work. And so... The, the divine righteousness that we receive from God as a gift then has to be maintained by the righteousness that we achieve. And so if that be true, then logically salvation is received by faith but maintained by works. And so now, now you've got a works um, salvation. Salvation is given by God's power then but maintained through man's power. So that's the logic that would that would follow if that if that be true. So basically what I'm saying is that all boils down to a works righteousness. All right? So the false doctrine of losing one's salvation teaches that if a Christian's life does not measure up to God's standard, then he can lose his salvation. You know, one day he's saved and the next day he's lost. Saved one day and lost, you know, back into a roller coaster. You know, what kind of security is that? You know, what kind of hope is that? What kind of assurance is that? What kind of peace is that? You know, what kind of commitment would that be? And so verse 6 says that while we were still sinners or yet sinners, uh, without hope or without strength, in some translations, my new King James is without strength, at the perfect time, the right time, Christ died for us. And so God's greatest manifestation of his love or his commitment uh, to us is that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, you know, to pay our penalty. And, and, and he's saying, even when we didn't deserve it, Jesus Christ loved us to the point that he died for us, even though there's going to be multi-millions is going to reject that offer of grace. He died for them as well. You know, we didn't deserve it at all. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us when we were still his enemy, is what it said here. Um, we were totally uh, powerless to escape from our own uh, penalty, our just penalty, which is eternal death. Uh, we were powerless to please him uh, we, we owed a sin debt that we could not possibly pay. But Christ's substitutionary death on the cross paid our sin debt and, and made us righteous, right, before a holy God. Now, that's amazing love. That's an amazing commitment. You know, there's a song that says, Amazing love, how can that be that uh, you, my king, have died for me? And so that, that's a love so amazing that uh, it's absolutely uh, beyond human comprehension. Um, you know, our definition of love is that uh, we love if we are loved back. Um, 
we love those that love us. But God's kind of love is not like that. God, the Bible says that God loved everybody. You know, we, we were sinners before we got saved, those of us who are. Uh, but we were his enemy. He died for us anyway. And there are still people out there that are lost. And they're his enemy. He died for them as well. You know, God loved everybody. He sent his son to die for all. Even knowing that there were going to be a huge amount that's going to reject his offer of grace. You know, the Bible says that broad is the way to destruction and narrow is the way so and few get in. So it says to me that there may be more loss the people's going to reject it than that does accept it. And so, but he died for those two. He died for those two. You know, God's nature is to love. Not because we loved him first, but because he loved us first. Um, but because of our human nature, you know, we, attend, we tend to attribute man's kind of love to God. That is, we must be good in order for God to love us. Or if we love him a lot, then he loves us a lot. Listen, God loves us in spite of us. He loves me in spite of me. And, and, I, and are I glad? Aren't you glad? So follow this. If God loved us because we first loved him, then logic would say that he would love, he would only love us so long as we loved him. And on that condition, right, then our salvation would depend upon the consistency of our heart or the commitment of our heart. Now that's a scary thought, right? Because our hearts are desperately wicked, desperately treacherous. You know, our emotions go up and down all, all the time. And so it's a good thing that our salvation is not dependent on, on us. It's a good thing then that God loves us or is committed to us to the nth degree, even though we were not worthy. And, and even though we're not lovely. Now in verse 7, uh, Paul gives an example from the secular view um, in verse 7, it said, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, perhaps for a good man someone would dare die. Uh, so Paul is saying that it would be very difficult to find a person who would die for a really righteous or a really good person. But it would be still less common if someone would die for another of less character. But God did die. God did send his son Jesus Christ to die for those of less character. I'm one of them. You know, even those uh, who are wicked, uh, even those who would, who would blaspheme, he died for all. You know, this is another good point to make about our security or his commitment to us. If he died for us when we were his enemy because he loved us uh, and loved us so much, then surely he continues to love us as his children. I mean, that's what Paul's getting here. So this is the logic. Now, verse 8 God demonstrates his love and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. So that kind of love is beyond human comprehension. You know, he, he hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Now, and let me stop there just for a second and say that's good advice uh, for us as well. We have got to learn and accept the fact that uh, we're sinners and uh, our family and friends, people, they're sinners as well. And so when we mess up, they mess up, we need to, to learn to, to hate the sin, but love that sinner. And uh, that, that's what another point is being made here. We, we all may know people who are, are lost, but you know, they don't hate God. Uh, they, they just want to allow God to have control of their lives. We may know someone that actually hates God. And uh, even deny his very existence. I, I've talked to lots of atheists in my in my time, uh, but God loves them just like He loves those that trust Him, and He'll continue to love them during uh, their age of grace. You know their uh, life here on this earth. But then it's appointed unto man uh, wants to die, and then there's going to be a judgment, and and then God's love is no longer going to be available. Uh, to that person. Uh, only his uh, divine wrath and judgment will. Now verses 9 to 10, it says much more then. So 
What Paul's saying is this. What I'm about to say is even more overwhelming than what I've already said. He says, having been justified, uh, that refers to the initial act of salvation. So what Paul is saying is this. We have been saved initially, and we will be saved from his wrath through Jesus Christ. And so it's entirely biblically correct to say that we have been saved, we're being saved, and we're going to be saved. That's all a part of the salvation plan. And, and so now that we're identified with Christ, Paul is saying, we have been adopted as children, so we are joint heirs. That makes me a king's kid. Now that's pretty cool, right? Every Christian is a king's kid. You know, we're, we're joint heirs now. We're going to share in the, in, in the uh, glory that's going to come. And so we're no longer children of wrath. We're no longer his, his enemy or at war with God. Uh, Jesus Christ suffered that wrath for us, the wrath that we deserve. Now, verse 10 says this. If God had the power to save us, then he certainly has the power to keep us safe. The logic follows, right? You know, Paul was a very brilliant, intellectually genius of a guy. But he has some real sound logic, too. And so if God brought us to himself through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, when we were his enemies, how much more, now that we are his children, will he keep us saved by the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, he's alive. He's alive. My Redeemer lives. And uh, I, I love that song, My Redeemer Lives. He not only has the power to save us, but he has the power to keep us saved. So we've been saved. We're being saved. We shall be saved. And any doubts that we have about his love or his commitment to us about our eternal security are our doubts, not his we have got to learn to trust what in his promises, all right? And so the doubts that we have are entirely ours and not his because he is able. Now, follow the logic. Uh, how can a Christian whose past salvation and future salvation are secured by God be insecure then during the time in between? This is Paul's argument. This is his logic. And if sin was no barrier to the beginning of our redemption, how can it be a barrier to the completion of our salvation? I mean, the logic follows, and it's, it's beautiful logic, right? If God's grace covers the sins of even his enemies, how much more does it cover the sins of his children? And so this, this is Paul's logic. Now, verse 11, uh, uh, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son and much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life all right so uh this is talking about the joy you know that comes with that and and that's beautiful joy comes with being with knowing Jesus Christ and there's a peace that passes all understanding right and so why is it then that we can rejoice why is it that we have this joy. Why, do, why is it that we can boast about our salvation? Because God reconciled us to himself through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. This is what Paul said to us. We were given a gift that was absolutely unearned. That's the definition of grace. Totally by grace, unmerited. But boy, did we desperately need it. And that brings joy unspeakable. You know, Psalm 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord, let us rejoice. Now, verse 12, and uh, it says, Therefore, all right, so we always look to see what's there for. Because Christians have been reconciled to God by the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, he said here that sin entered the world through one man, and death came as a result. Now, obviously, that is a mystery. Um, uh, that when Adam uh, sinned, the first man, then he passed on that sin nature to all his descendants. Uh, now, genetically and physiologically, I can't explain. It's a, it's a mystery. Um, but now we've got to move over to um, verses 18 to 21 to finish up here. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, um, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, boy, that's a, that's a lot there, but um, we don't have time to explore all of it. But verse 18 says, Therefore, or consequently, uh, because sin entered the human race through one man, uh, talking about Adam, and, and because Adam sinned, all his descendants are condemned. That's the condemnation. And so, but then through one man's obedience, talking about Jesus Christ, uh, his righteous act came the gift of justification. And so then verses 20 and 21 says, then the law crept in. All right. Grace and law are contrasted here. Grace was not an add-on to God's plan of salvation. It was always there. It was always a part of God's plan from the beginning. God dealt with everyone through grace, even Adam, even Adam. He gave the law to Moses not to replace grace, but to reveal man's need for grace. You see, the law made man's sin increase, but grace was more than adequate to deal with it. And the reason it made, um, it made us more aware of our need for a Savior. And so, but grace was more than adequate to deal with man's sin. And although sin and death still reign in this world, God's grace is also reigning through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, oh, what a Savior uh, that is. You know, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were fully committed to us.